Your commentator is Basil Risedale. The first military surprise blow in the Italian stalemate comes in a bold, large-scale landing on the Nazi Hill coast near Anzio. Yanks of the American Fifth Army seize a wide beachhead. Swarming ashore in force, they take the German high command completely unaware. British units of the invading force come ashore from the fleet of landing craft to back up the American divisions. Nazi bombers meet a warm reception, but get over the target. Throughout the landing operations, the bombs rain down. Nazi troopers lie where they fell. Fires sweep Anzio. It is here that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Now the Nazis try to turn the tables. Weapons, supplies, and men pour ashore until the beachhead becomes firmly established and a threat to Rome that puts Hitler on the anxious alert. South of the casino area, swirling floodwaters and terrific handicaps of the Italian terrain face the Allied armies. Pontoon bridges are frequently swept away as calm rivers suddenly burst into roaring torrents. Engineer battalions struggle valiantly to keep communications open. There is no battle area anywhere where nature is more closely allied with the enemy than in Italy. The battle-hardened Yanks, supported by British artillery, continue to move up, exerting a constant pressure on the Gustav line. Even the patient donkey becomes hardened to war. The Italian people reap the bitter fruit of fascism's alliance with Hitler. A man on the firing line films the famous American bazooka as it blasts a nearby Nazi pillbox. The roar of Allied artillery continues, with this deafening chorus constantly reverberating through the war-torn hills. German artillery checks its range from a water tower, so Allied engineers destroy it. American veterans of Sicily and Salerno are in the thick of the fighting and adding to their laurels, putting Hitler's best storm troops to their most severe test. These tough Nazis have had enough. The village is entered, close to fortified heights that dominate the Allied lines. So they prepare to take action. It is the ancient St. Benedictine Monastery, occupied and fortified by the Nazis. Pamphlets of warning are strewn over the objective before the bombardment begins. After due warning, the artillery gets the rain. From those heights, the Nazis have shelled American and British troops for weeks, causing serious casualties. Now the bombers operating from captured Italian fields come over to teach the Germans that no sacrilege of ancient landmarks can save Hitler. Enemy gun emplacements on the hills around Casino are hammered without let up as the constant allied pressure on enemy lines draws heavily on Hitler's reserves of men, his weakening air force, his oil, his armor, his munitions.
thousands of empty shell cases speak eloquently of the fury of the Allies' fight for Rome. Mildest winter in Russian memory fails to save the Nazi invaders as the Red Army smashes forward from Leningrad to Ukraine. Soldiers of Soviet Russia press on to the very borders of Latvia, Poland, and Romania with complete disregard of heavy Nazi shell fire. Advance guard is stopped by the fire from a crippled Nazi tank, still serving as a makeshift pillbox for its crew. The enemy is driven out and shot down. The world marvels at the long sustained power of an offensive stretching 800 miles from Stalingrad all the way to the trembling Balkan. Frontline's casualties get immediate first aid by heroic nurses. German mechanized equipment is battered and abandoned from the Gulf of Finland to the Bug River. But Nazi strategy is to force the Russians to pay as heavily as possible in munitions and men for every mile reconquered. Enemy artillery tries to find a destructive Red Army rocket battery hidden somewhere in this area. Field Marshal Timoshenko watches the blasting of enemy positions. Smolensk, Gomel, Kiev, Riboyarov, and thousands of smaller towns are swept clean of the enemy. Hundreds of thousands of Germans either perish or surrender. Complete ruin is left behind by every retreating Nazi division. They blast and burn in a senseless orgy of destruction. The bitter fruit of Hitler's intuition is not only useless slaughter and waste, but a Russian hatred of everything German symbolized by a thousand flaming villages. Through the flame-lighted streets of a recaptured town, Soviet tide floods on toward Poland and Romania, sweeping the shaken enemy before it, with never a let-up in months of fighting. Suicide squads of the German rear guard are encountered. There goes a grenade, and there goes a Nazi sniper. On the heels of the victorious army, Russian peasants straggle back into their devastated villages in pitiful groups. Everything lost, homes, personal belongings, and most of their men. The Red Army frequently gains from 10 to 15 miles a day, smashing great holes in the German positions from the Privet Marshes to the Black Sea. The intense emotional joy of Russia's liberated people blinds them to scenes of destruction. Every soldier is a conquering hero. Homes may be aflame, but a woman kneels in thanksgiving. Everywhere, peasants weep for joy that the Nazis are beaten. Out of hiding comes a suffering people. The procession of Hitler's hoodlums passes under guard, mainly to protect them from an enraged people. The rumble of a Soviet tank brings out the children with a wild joy. Every Russian soldier is decked with garlands and hailed for his courageous part in Russia's smashing offensive. 